Well, and a fine Saturday morning to you out there. Russ Barkley here with your weekly ADHD research update. Today we're going to talk about five studies I thought were noteworthy. But before we do that, of course, it's time for those terrible dad jokes. Today they're going to come to you uh, from today.com. And here you go. First up, did you hear about the two rowboats that got into an argument? It was an ordeal. <laughs> I don't think that too, took too much uh, brain power to come up with that one. So why shouldn't you tell secrets in a cornfield? Now, this is obvious. There are too many ears around. So, okay, last one we're going to talk about is what do you call it when a cow grows facial hair? A moustache. I've got one. See it? That's my moustache. Okay, enough of those terrible dad jokes. Hopefully you can forgive me. So uh, first up is going to be a study. It's actually a review uh, known as an expert review written by people who, of course, are very competent in the field of psychopharmacology. And this one is a review of non-stimulant medications for adults with ADHD. It was published over in the journal Expert Review of Neurotherapeutics. And as always, you can find the hot links to the articles over in the description that goes with this video. And remember, I only give you the articles I discuss now uh, rather than giving you everything that was published this week. So now this is not a meta-analysis. It's kind of a study by study review of these non-stimulant medications. We know that the stimulant medications are very effective for ADHD, so there's little reason to keep reviewing that literature. They produce the largest improvements for the greatest number of people across the most domains of impairment of any of the categories of medication. So that's kind of a settled issue. What we want to know is what other medications might be useful because we know that about 25% of people with ADHD may not respond to any single stimulant. Although if you try the different stimulants and the different delivery systems on the market today, you may find you can get that figure up another 10 to 15% to about 85 to 90% or more. Nonetheless, that still leaves a large group of people who are not responding to these drugs. And we want to know about the utility, the effectiveness of these other drugs. So this review looks at the non-stimulants. And what does it find? It finds that, of course, the greatest amount of evidence for any non-stimulant is for atomoxetine, often called Stratera here in the U.S. This is a drug that influences the amount of norepinephrine that is available in the brain, and it does it by blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine from the synaptic space when it is released. And there are many, many studies now on the usefulness of atomoxetine, not only for adults, but for children and teens. It appears to be nearly equally as effective as methylphenidate, not quite as effective as the amphetamine-based drugs, but a very good drug nonetheless for treating adults with ADHD. Now, the next category of medications that they looked at were the antidepressants, uh, as well as other noradrenergic and dopaminergic drugs. All that simply means is that's the neurotransmitter primarily affected by these non-stimulants. And what they found is that some tricyclics, as well as bupropion, known as the Wellbutrin brand name here in the U.S., and veloxazine, all were found to have some demonstrated effectiveness in helping people with ADHD. Maybe not quite as good as atomoxetine, maybe not, certainly not quite as good as the stimulants, but nonetheless, very helpful. So those drugs seem to be additional ones that one can consider using, even if they're being used off-label. Off-label means they're not approved here in the U.S. by the FDA for use with ADHD, but that doesn't prevent physicians from prescribing them anyway. And we see that especially with the drug Wellbutrin or bupropion. Now, 
The review also finds that certain antihypertensive drugs, like guanfacine, which is guanfacine XR here in the U.S., were also helpful, and to a much lesser extent, other drugs like memantine, metadoxine, and some mood stabilizers, stabilizers excuse me, might have been helpful. But the evidence for them is much less uh, sizable than for the other drugs that I've talked about. And finally, they found no effectiveness for the antipsychotics, for cannabinoids, which are derived from, as you know, marijuana, and then uh, galantamine. So those drugs don't appear to be especially helpful. And for the cannabinoids, it's because there simply isn't an awful lot of evidence out there one way or the other. But they found that they weren't especially useful. So overall, a fine review that tells us that other drugs, particularly non-stimulants like atomoxetine, like Welbutrin or Bupropion, as it's called, and Veloxazine, might be useful for ADHD as well. So uh, a nice review by the experts there. Moving on, we're now going to talk about the effectiveness and safety of another class of drugs known as monoamine reuptake inhibitors. And how well do they do for ADHD? Now this one is a meta-analysis and it found 31 separate relevant drug trials to review and the results of their review are that the efficacy and safety of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs, is pretty good. Venlaxifene, veloxazine, and again, bupropion, well, butrin, were the most efficacious of the drugs reviewed. Again, let's remember, these are not as good as the stimulants, probably not even as good as atomoxetine, that's less clear, but certainly they are better than placebo in helping patients with ADHD. And again, I would just want to make note that if one were to try the approved stimulants, the approved non-stimulants, such as the norepinephrine drugs like atomoxetine, and those don't work, well, butrin or bupropion seems to be seems to have the most evidence for its effectiveness as a third class of medications one might wish to use. And then, of course, let's not forget, there are those antihypertensive drugs as well, guanfacine specifically. Uh, so these appear to be the most useful medications apart from the stimulants in helping people with ADHD. So another good review published over there in the Journal of Psychiatric Research. Okay, let's move on to a different topic now. This is one I've covered many times over the past year. This is a review published in the journal Addictive Behaviors, and it's a systematic review of all of the literature on the relationship of problematic gaming and ADHD in teenagers. And this particular review found 30 different studies on this topic. As the review notes, problematic gaming has been identified in somewhere between 4 to 8% of adolescents. However, ADHD has been found to range from 45 to 78% among those with problematic gaming. So what does that mean? It means that if you find someone with problematic gaming and they're a teenager, there is a very high probability that they have ADHD as part of their range of difficulties. So problematic gaming appears to be linked to ADHD very strongly. And of course, we know the opposite is true. If you have ADHD, we know that at least a third or more of those people with ADHD as teenagers are likely to qualify as problematic gamers. Some studies find it even higher than that. So there's something about ADHD, probably the limited self-regulation, the poor impulse control that makes individuals much more likely to become addicted to or at least problematic with their gaming on computers. So there you have it, or computer-based games. Now, this study also found that other psychiatric comorbidities also 
increased the risk even further of problematic gaming. So what they found is that problematic gamers were not only likely to have ADHD, but they also had anxiety, depression, and emotional and behavioral problems. And each of those added further to the prediction of problematic gaming. So it's not just ADHD that we're talking about here linked to gaming problems, but other disorders as well. But ADHD seems to be numero uno as the disorder most linked to gaming problems. All right, let's move on to another study. This published over in the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal. This is a longitudinal study of all-cause mortality and suicide among individuals with ADHD. Now, we've talked about this before, so no surprise. There certainly is a relationship between ADHD and increased risk over the lifespan for all-cause mortality. Children with ADHD are two to three times more likely to die by their 10th birthday, and adults with ADHD are four to five times more likely to die by midlife. And as I've said, even if you make it to midlife, those who are not getting treated for their ADHD then have about a 12-year reduction in their life expectancy. So that's all well understood. This is a large study, uh, and it comes out of Taiwan, which has a national healthcare registry. And it looks at people who were diagnosed with ADHD between 2003 and 2017. So it's following about 1.2 million individuals were enrolled, of which over a quarter million of those, 233,000, were diagnosed with ADHD. And then it follows them up over time, comparing those with ADHD to the rest of the population in risk for mortality during the follow-up period. And what they found is that people with ADHD were nearly 50% more likely to have died by the follow-up period as a result of a variety of unnatural causes, usually meaning accidental injuries from their misadventures. But they also found suicide in particular was more likely. They found that in individuals with ADHD, right, those who were more likely to commit suicide had substance use disorders, personality disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and as you can imagine, major depression. Each of those disorders further increased the risk of suicide above the risk associated with ADHD alone. So again, ADHD is the big predictor here of all-cause mortality in this follow-up study, particularly for suicide, but other disorders are contributing risk as well. So again, this is not new. We've known of this for quite some time. This is in untreated individuals. There are many reviews that indicate that being treated with medication lowers these risks of mortality and suicide to nearly that of the typical population. So don't get too depressed about this because there's a lot of hope out there that treatment reduces or eliminates these risks. Just one more reason that people with ADHD should be getting treatment for it. Okay, our last paper, going to leave you on a more upbeat note here, is a meta-analysis of exercise intensity in improving the executive functions of patients with ADHD. So it goes out and reviews 29 different studies now, combines all of their data together, and finds that of all of the variables they look at, high intensity exercise was most helpful for improving working memory and inhibition. Whereas moderate intensity or higher, but especially moderate intensity, was best for improving the executive function of cognitive flexibility. So the authors point out that yet again, there is lots of evidence that exercise is a good means 
of coping with and temporarily reducing the symptoms of ADHD, and in this review, find that it also improves executive functioning. Now, it's not a cure-all. Just because you exercise doesn't mean it's going to permanently get rid of ADHD and executive deficits. What it is showing is that high-intensity periodic exercise as part of your lifestyle can be very helpful at reducing the impact of ADHD on your life and improving your executive functioning. So there you have it, five really interesting papers published this week, along with some pretty bad dad jokes. Thanks for joining me this Saturday for this research review. I hope you found it informative. As always, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing. I think you'll find the information on the channel is very helpful, particularly my weekly commentaries and these weekly research reviews. Uh, in the meantime, as always, live well, be well, and take care, everybody. Bye.